Hi, my name is Georgia D. Nicola. And I'm Kylie Wagner, and we're juniors at Falmouth High School. So this year, our project is the rapid spread of COVID-19. So for our project, we wanted to examine how masks um, affected your behavioral tendencies of touching your face. To begin this experiment, we felt it was very necessary to educate ourselves entirely on both the virus itself as well as the psychological aspects to COVID-19. COVID-19 is a highly contagious virus. The virus is transmitted predominantly through the eyes, nose, and mouth of an individual. When those who are infected with the virus either sneeze, cough, or even talk, there are droplets that are emitted into the air. These droplets in some cases cannot even be seen with the bare eye as they're microscopic. Um, the particles are oftentimes called aerosols as they're responsible for carrying the virus into the air from one's nose or mouth. As the droplets shortly after fall onto various surrounding surfaces, as humans touch their faces, COVID-19 begins its rapid invasion of the body. Within the virus, we see these spike proteins and these very proteins are responsible for allowing the virus to enter into human cells. Next, I'm gonna talk about why you touch your face. Numerous studies have shown that touching your face occurs to stop sensations like discomfort, or itching, but it also serves as a self-soothing maneuver. Touching your face has quickly become daily ha a daily habit for many, many humans. Some face touching is even an automatic reflex because you do it subconsciously since you've been doing it so regularly. On the other hand, sometimes you touch your face as a way to express emotion, such as if you're nervous, you might cover your face more. Since humans have repeatedly touched their face so often over so many years, this action now triggers the basal manglia part of your brain. The basal manglia is a set of subcortical nuclei in the cibrium. It is involved in the integration and selection of voluntary behavioral or just habits. Um, there are also psychological aspects of touching your face in addition to the anatomy of the brain. For the same reason that I'm going to be thinking about an itchy shirt or tight pants throughout the day is the same reason that I'm going to be wanting to touch my face when I'm wearing a mask. It's a foreign object covering nearly half of my face and also obstructs my um, cellular respiration process by covering my mouth and nose. Now, obviously, yes, we can still breathe with masks, but it's going to force us to think about the areas that it's covering. We're going to think about if it's on correctly, if there's any gaps and we're going to get the virus. Um, when you talk, sometimes your mask will slip or move, forcing you to constantly readjust it, furthering the need um, to touch your face and ease the discomfort. Who's glow germ? Um, so glow germ is a substance, it's a powder, and it can also come in lotion, but in this case, we felt that it was better fit to use the powder as it showed the transmission in a much more effective way. So it's a substance that contains toxic plastic simulated germs. It works to graphically demonstrate and simulate the spread of germs. So in this case, we're simulating COVID-19 and the way that if one were to emit the droplets into the environment and then someone else were either to come in contact with those droplets either through touching the surfaces or either through being in the same air and then for them to then touch their face, it would enter through either the mouth, nose, or eyes and then the rapid spread of COVID-19 would then go throughout the body and transmit glow germ it is a powdery substance and when you apply it to a it surface and shine an ultraviolet light to the surface it glows so if someone were to touch that glow germ and then say touch your face it would show on the face again mimicking the behavior that germs do and the transmission of COVID-19 our hypothesis was if we trace the viral spread in various individuals wearing a mask then they would be more likely to touch their face and in turn contaminate themselves. So we also thought that it was important to take our hypothesis and actually go more into depth and to split it up into the three main places that you can contract an illness, in this case being the virus of COVID-19. So we did the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and then overall. So for the eyes, we felt that there would actually be a slight decrease when people were to be wearing a mask of amount of glow germ on the face as well as the amount of times the recipients would touch their face. We felt this because when you're wearing a mask, the focus is on the region that is covered by the mask versus 
um, the area that's not such as your eyes. And for the nose region, we also felt that there would be minimal changes as um, the nose is also a place that many people feel discomfort commonly. And when wearing a mask, it would not necessarily be focused on that region. But for the mouth, we felt that there would be a significant increase as it is the main area that's being occupied by the mask. And when people talk, and even when I, Kylie and I are talking here, we feel the mask moving and a need to move the mask and readjust it to ease the discomfort. We're gonna move on to the actual experiment itself. And so materials, we obviously needed a glow germ powder. We did 30 participants and we realized that more participants would have made the um, experiment more reliable. But given the circumstances of right now in COVID-19, we just didn't want to be contaminating so many different things because there were there was a time where um the participants didn't have a mask on and even though we kept a safe distance we just 30 30 recipients was just enough for us for this experiment mm -hmm. and then so we also needed our ultraviolet light to show the um glow germ and then a timer to set the 30 minutes for um the recipients equal mask for each recipient mm -hmm. so moving on to the procedure of this experiment first we had to make sure that the recipients were unaware of the purpose of the glow germ so through this, we actually had this wrapped in a similar way as this to make sure that the recipients were not aware of what the experiment was and that it was with intentions of them touching their face so that they would not be um, feel encouragement to touch their face or act in a specific way. So then with the use of the dusting brush, we applied one teaspoon of the glow powder evenly to both palms of the recipient hands. We placed the recipients in a confined space and set a timer for 30 minutes. In this 30 minutes, we recorded each time the recipient touched their face. And then after the 30 minutes concluded, we recorded each time and made sure that our data was all set in stone. After this, we placed the ultraviolet light on their face and took a picture um, looking at how much of the glow germ was present on their face. We had to ensure that all the participants' um, glow germ was present um, under the UV uh, light. And then once the session was done, we allowed the participants to wash their hands and face and really anywhere the glow germ was, so we would have a clean slate of um, where any glow germ would be so that it wouldn't be um, contaminated for the next one. We provided the um, recipients with a new unused reusable surgical mask uh, and then we repeated processes two through seven um, without a mask. Recorded the data and compared the amount of glow germ on the face and number of times the participants touched their face with and without a surgical mask. So we listed just a few of the 30 recipients. Now moving on to our data. Our first way that we decided to represent our data. So we first did the number of times the participants touched their face with a mask. In this case, the participants touched their face anywhere from two to 19 times. And as you can see, most of the participants without a mask on touched their face about 10 times, but then when they had a mask on, um, it ranged from seven to 19, and most of the participants touched their face 18 times. And then our other demonstration was the percent of face occupied with glow germ on participants without a mask and with a mask. Right here, there's a lot more data on the higher side of this than there is right here. And obviously there's a little bit of an outlier right there. And then we continued with breaking it up on the nose, eye, and mouth area. And the eye area reduced when they wore a mask. And then as well as the nose and mouth area when they wore a mask. So moving on, this is when we did the entire face all together with a mask versus not with a mask. And you can see that the amount of glow germ when the participants were wearing a mask, that of which being the red, was significantly increased for each of the participants. This is just a combined graph of the um, second two graphs for a better comparison. Um, but overall, when focusing on the whole face, we are able to see um, major increases in the amount of germs spread. Um, those were not those who were not wearing a mask had glow germs occupying 19.33 of the face, while those who were wearing a mask had glow germs occupying 27.87%.
of their face, um, resulting in an 8.54 increase. Okay, so in conclusion, to wrap this all up, we were able to understand through a different experiment that overall we're more susceptible to touch our face when wearing a mask. So we must take the precautions in ensuring that we do not heighten our risk of contracting COVID-19 if we're wearing a mask. This can be done through understanding our mind and its need to ease discomfort of wearing a mask. We must withhold from this need to touch our face and keep our hands away from our face. It's also important that individuals make a conscious effort to wash their hands thoroughly and ensure that it's completely sanitized. This will help in fighting off the virus. Thank you. I hope you yeah. enjoyed. Bye. Of nutrient supplementation on the yield of oil produced by nanochloropsis. So our question for our experiment was what sup supplements can be added to nanochloropsis to produce more oils when extracted? Um, our hypothesis was if we supplement nanochloropsis with sodium bicarbonate, sodium nitrate, and sodium phosphate, then sodium bicarbonate will increase the yield of oil the most because ionized bicarbonate provides a carbon source for algae to synthesize hydrocarbon chains, which is what lipids are made out of, which are extracted as a usable oil. The sodium nitrate and sodium phosphate will likely not have a great effect on oil production, but will support growth and in turn lipid output. So for research, we kind of blocked it up. So for, we started off with algae. Algae are a diverse group of aquatic organisms that can be um, unicellular or multicellular. Uh, algae has been chosen as our source of lipid production because of its rapid growth. It's, it's carbon neutral as it requires CO2 to photosynthesize. Um, and it's non-competitive -com with food crops and requires less water than land crops. Um, all forms of algae convert sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into energy through photosynthesis. Um, algae is also highly diversified in their habitats where they can grow in freshwater lakes, oceans, puddles, on trees, etc. Basically any viable um, environment. While most algae are photoautotrophs, some are capable of osmotrophy or the absorption of dissolved nutrients, which proves that algae are capable of using our supplements through this process. Um, Nanochloropsis, a genus of algae, has been identified as one of the most promising kinds of algae for the production of biofuels. Nanochloropsis has an affinity for accumulating large amounts of lipids, even in nutrient-limited environments. So now on to lipid production. Uh, lipid production in algae is necessary for cellular functions when light intensity is variable or gone, such as during nighttime. Uh, carbon is rationed in microalgae for both the production of lipids in the form of triglycerides and starches. Neutral lipids and polar lipids are produced by microalgae. However, neutral lipids are the main source of reserved energy as polar lipids are used for organelles and other cellular structures. Uh, lipid extraction, there are numerous methods, numerous methods to extract the lipids from the algae. Uh, the easiest method is through an oil press. Uh, through any kind of pressing method, up to 75% of the oil can be extracted from the algae um, just by sheer force, no chemical components. Uh, the hexane solvent method requires pressing out the oil, like I mentioned in the previous method. Um, then the leftover algae is mixed with hexane, which separates the lipids from the algae. The mixture is unfiltered and cleaned, leaving only the lipids behind. Research continued. Uh, another method is the supercritical carbon dioxide extraction, which uses highly pressurized and high temperature carbon dioxide and it's used to extract the lipids from the cells. This process is the quickest and yields the most oil, but is very complex and requires expensive equipment. Um, then we have the use of sound waves to break apart cells. Um, and then after that, you let the cellular inning settle. Lipids will separate and rise to the top of the mixture where they can be taken out. Um, and then we have decided that the, that the pressing method is the only possible method for us to use as it is the cheapest and requires the least amount of equipment and materials. So for supplement selection, we selected sodium bicarbonate. Um, the disassociation of sodium bicarbonate in water produces an inorganic carbon source for algae to use in lipid production, likely more efficient than atmospheric CO2 since it has a lower solubility rate than uh, sodium bicarbonate does. And the storage of, car of gaseous CO2 is much more costly than bicarbonate salts. Um, so if you were to use a bubbler to bubble in CO2 to increase um, a carbon source, 
that would cost way more in comparison to just having bicarbonate salts. Um, and then sodium nitrate and sodium phosphate. Uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus are essential in alg algae growth and cellular processes. We believe that there's a possibility that these compounds could affect both the growth of the algae and the lipid production. So now for materials. Um, so to start off our algae, we got an algae research, or from algae research supply, we got an algae culture kit for nanochloripsis. We got four of them. This contained a small bag of salt to make a half liter of media. Um, a one milliliter algae dense culture. And the company we bought from had a modified media formula. Um, we then we had eight plastic water bottles, uh, a growing light with that it has ultraviolet and a shelf for growing. Then we had sodium nitrate, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium phosphate, each in a one gram per liter solution. Uh, we need an electric scale, 50 milliliter beakers, a four liter jug and a mechanical press. So our variables for the control, we had the algae culture flask uh, with no added supplements or chemicals. The independent variable is sodium nitrate, our independent variables are sodium nitrate, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium phosphate, which were all in the one gram per liter solution. And those are the compounds we were supplementing to each algae culture flask. And the dependent variable was the amount of oil produced by each algae culture. Um, our procedure was first we had to obtain the four nanochloropsis culture kits. Then we dissolved each of the salt bags um, into, so we got four total salt bags. We uh, added that to two liters of water and we shook that. And then we added the provided nutrients as well to that two liters of salt water and shook that as well. So we now had two liters of nutrient salt water solution and we um, added 50 milliliters of that to each of our eight water bottles. And then we added the one mil um, algae culture to each bottle and we shook those as well. So we set all eight um, bottles under the UV light with the grow light on a 12 hour on and off cycle. And we shook those throughout the day. And so we added the chemicals and the supplements as the algae grew, which was roughly every five days for 25 days. And then we would drain the uh, algae to isolate it from the water, press the algae with a mechanical press until no further oil can be extracted and measure the volume of oil extracted per gram of algae for each trial. So we had to rework our procedure. Um, as the deadline approached, it became very clear that the algae was not dense enough to press and we needed to find a way to separate the algae from the water. So we uh, had to rework our procedure instead to determine the amount of algae each trial produced. So first uh, we tried to filter the algae from most of the water using coffee filters and then heat those coffee filters in the oven to fully evaporate all the water. And then that would leave us with only the algae in the coffee filter and we would weigh the difference to determine the mass of the algae. Uh, however, this ended up not working because the algae wasn't dense enough. And when we tried to filter it with the coffee filter, it just went right through with the water and there was nothing left in the coffee filter. So we decided to just pour the whole culture onto a tray and put that in the oven um, at 300 degrees Fahrenheit to evaporate the water instead without filtering it first. And then we would hope that the algae would be only left on the tray with all the water fully evaporated. And so after we left the samples in the oven for almost two hours, uh, there was still about 50% of the water remaining. And on only one of the samples came out mostly dry but there was such little amount of algae on that sample that we had no guarantee that we could scrape all of it off and have a measurable amount. Um, so our conclusion was that nearly uh, 30 days of growing our algae, we had no measurable amount or way to extract the oil from the algae. And we were forced to rework our procedure and change our question to determine the yield of algae produced, but our methods proved unable to find a consistent and reliable data for that. So while our experiment may not have worked for analytical findings, we were able to use the scientific method and try and get around our restrictions and left a lot of room for improvement for anyone else to do this uh, experiment or for us to as well in the future. Um, it proved a lot harder than just growing algae as simple as that may seem, but there's a lot of things that we would both change in the future. So shaking the bottles is a good way to mix the air and it just proved inconsistent and unreliable, and we would 
rather use an aerator with CO2, but that's also very difficult because you need to know the exact amount of CO2 added to the algae to not uh, add too much or too little. So that's uh, a lot of work as well. We would also allow for more time and hoping that more algae would, um, the algae would be more dense and easier to measure and also possibly add more nutrient media, media along the way. Um, also a flocculant or a centrifuge might be um, very helpful to clump the algae together. And also different methods from extracting the oil instead of just the force from the press would be better, like possibly using chemicals. And these are some pictures of on the left, it's the day one and the day near the end of the um, algae growth. And there's um, part of the journal on the right hand side. And at the bottom there is, um, at the beginning when we tried to put simply pour the algae on the tray and put it in the oven. And that at the top middle is a chart for the uh, nanochloropsis, the strand we chose and the, what, how high oil content it has. And this is our work cited. Thank you. All right, so we did our science project on the effectiveness of masks. So it's been a hotly contested debate about the effectiveness of masks. On one side, you have the scientists with data that reinforce the facts that masks reduce virus transmission. But on the other hand, you have those who deny science and continue to spread misinformation and the virus. In this experiment, we aim to try to reinforce the scientists' argument and add more facts to that case. So our hypotheses were that Ben says that he thinks all masks will be good overall. In the surgical mask, as it's used in surgery and medical purposes, that's going to be the best. However, I thought that all masks, again, would work in stopping the spread of the water vapor, which we were testing, and the buff, the neck gator, the one that goes around your head, that would be the least effective. So for the experiment, the actual procedure we did, uh, first, we did a control without wearing a mask. Um, and we basically held up a, a tape measure to the side of our mouth and we would breathe three times and measure the average distance that the water vapor uh, traveled. And then we would do that the same for that with talking and yelling um, for the control. And then we would do the same, but with various masks that are all pictured there, uh, breathing, talking and yelling and taking the average of those three trials. All right. So these are some images of how we perform the test. In the top left, you can see Ben, you know, with the uh, tape measure next to his head. And I was there kind of from the point of view of the camera there, seeing how far the water vapor came. So top left is no mask. Uh, bottom left is the gator. The center left, I guess you would say, that's the store-bought mask. Then the surgical mask. Then there's me on the right. When he actually ended up using the, um, the, the mask that school provided to us, because we thought it'd be interesting to see how those stack up to what the other, there are out there is out there, rather. So these were the results that we uh, got, basically. Um, we kind of grouped the type of mask together, and then B stands for breathing, T for talking, and Y for yelling. So you can see a general trend there. And overall, we came to the conclusion that we kind of expected that masks do work. Um, however, we kind of have to realize that this isn't the best way to represent it. Um, water vapor is a lot bigger, uh, the molecules of water, rather, they're going to be a lot larger than the virus. So they're going to be go, go right through the uh, mask a lot easier, the viruses, that is. Uh, you can see that any mask did make a pretty big impact. Um, it was a pretty sizable drop on the chart. And the buff was the worst out of all the masks. Um, I think this is kind of why the school, you aren't allowed to wear an FHS, you aren't allowed to wear in a lot of places. Uh, while our results were correct in showing that buffs are worse, the one thing that we really couldn't show was what the CDC warns against them. Uh, they aerosolize the particles. So they still like, they're still breathable for the virus, but also like spreads it out further, like wider range, I guess you could say. So in conclusion, uh, both of our hypotheses were somewhat correct. The general trend was that masks definitely helped. Although the specific mask that performed the best in the experiment was not the same mask that is generally agreed to be the most effective at containing the virus. Whereas in, uh, what the CDC says is that the surgical masks are the most effective and our experiment found that the store-bought was actually more effective. These results, while they may not be the most reliable for determining masks effectiveness of blocking a virus, definitely show that it's beneficial to wear a mask as opposed to not wearing a mask. 
In short, no, this isn't a pandemic, and please wear your mask. Pondering Precipitate in Ponds and Puddles by Gunnar and Axel Jensen. With the snow and uh, the wintry feel, obviously all of our roads are being salted uh, constantly to make sure the roads are ice free. And a lot of this salt is ending up being uh, put into the runoff and ending up in our ponds. So in our project, we were conducting a bioassay to determine if this effect had any uh, influence on the water quality of our ponds. Um, and we chose Daphnia as our model organism because it is see-through, so you can see the heart very well. They are relatively inexpensive, and Gunnar already had some experience using them last year in a previous project. And you can see the heartbeat of the Daphnia right there, that is its heart. It we wanted to see if the um, rainwater runoff had any effect on the condition of the ponds. So we sampled uh, five different locations. Um, of puddles and ponds nearby uh, after a rainstorm in January. And then we performed bioassays of these samples using a population of Daphnia. Uh, we hypothesized that the main pollutant due to the runoff would be the rock salt, um, and that the more toxic ponds would have more salt in them, and that would cause more uh, Daphnia to die. The procedure um, for the setup of this experiment was first choosing a couple locations around Falmouth that um, were relatively near each other, and we collected all of our water samples after a rainstorm. Uh, we collected from five different locations, each that had a pond and puddle near each other, and we also had a control that was just simply Acadia spring water, and as another test, we looked at five different concentrations of that spring water containing various amounts of salt. Here are some pictures of us taking samples. Here are at, uh, some puddles at St. Barnabas in the parking lot behind Main Street. And here we are at a couple ponds. We have Morse Pond and Jones Pond. Additionally, we, had, we took samples at Cider's Pond, Soul's Pond, and Shiverick's Pond. After we collected all of our water samples, we made sure to filter out all of the uh, debris and uh, particles from the water samples so they were all even. Uh, to do this, we used both a colander and also coffee filters that we just had around our house. And we made sure to wash the colander and all instruments after each filter so that they were all even. Um, and then we placed about 250 milliliters of each solution into beakers so that we all had the same water amountage. And we placed 30 Daphnia into each, uh, counting by hand using a pipette. Then. Every couple of hours, over a one week period, we record, recorded and removed the uh, dead Daphnia uh, to see how the water was affecting them. And additionally, we determined the pH, salinity, and nitrate levels of each sample. And here's a couple of pictures. This is us individually counting uh, the Daphnia. Uh, we had counted 30 to put in each. Uh, that is us counting the dead, and that is us uh, looking at the pH. As you can see from this chart, uh, these are the results we got from each location, and you can see that for each location we had a identification value where every number represents a location and the letter represents whether it was a pond or a puddle. For example, 1A was Jones Pond and 1B was Holiday Inn, both of which are right next to each other, so we used those kind of as a comparison. Um, we tried recording the pH on our own at home using a toolkit, but the instruments we had were not accurate enough, so we got them uh, done for us at MBL. Uh, similar thing with the salinity. salinity. Um, and for the salt solutions, we actually attempted to create the salinity ourselves using like tablespoons because we did not have something to weigh grams in and we were actually pretty close although they are a little bit off. And you can see that the pH of every uh, pond and puddle was very similar as well as the salinity except as an exception, Cider's Pond is actually a brackish pond so it's a bit of an outlier as far as salinity goes. So you can see on this chart the number of deaths uh, that we had for each uh, survey. Um, we removed the dead ones after each, so we didn't count them twice. Uh, and you can see this is the cumulative count, so at the end here is how many exactly died. 
Um, we tried to do it in even increments, but we couldn't do it exactly because we had to sleep. Um, but you can see here we did 4 to 8, uh, 8 to 16, 16 to 24. We created a couple of uh, graphs to represent the mortality rate over time. Uh, you can see that the orange lines represent the puddles and the blue lines represent the ponds. And in that case, a majority of the puddles were definitely more toxic than the ponds. Um, you can see in Soul's Pond, it was actually the other way around. But because so little Daphne had died, um, it is pretty much inconsequential that they were uneven. Because if we did the project again and looked at Soul's Pond, it would probably show that the puddles were actually higher. So prior to beginning our project, we did some research. And we found the LD50, or lethal dose 50%, for Daphnia magna which is a 5.1 grams per liter of salt. Uh, so we kind of base our solutions around that. We have one that's uh, exactly the LD50 and one that's double the LD50, along with a couple others, including a control, which has no salt. Um, and as you can see, the one that was double the LD50, they all died immediately. Um, and the one that was exactly the LD50, they took a while, but eventually they were all dead. Um, while the others kind of just uh, stayed near the bottom and not many died. Which shows us that uh, if there's not much salt, then it probably isn't all that toxic, even though it's toxic at higher concentrations. So on this table, we recorded all the different heart rates of the Daphnia before and after we moved them between the solutions. So you can see the uh, numbers may look very interesting and completely different, uh, but each individual Daphnia had a different heart rate. So we made sure to take multiple samples so that we could see the differences uh, very clearly, instead of uh, just looking at one Daphnia, we chose to do three instead. So the way we actually calculated the difference was first taking an average of before and after, and then finding the difference in all the averages, and then taking an average of all the differences. So that ended up giving us those numbers over on that side of the average difference, all of which had a negative effect on the Daphnia's heart rate. As we were doing research, we discovered that saline solutions should actually have uh, increased the heart rate. But that's not what we saw, as evident by this graph. Oh, you can see the blue lines are before, and the orange lines are after. And especially you can see really in these three examples, that the after heart rates are much lower than the before heart rates. And this tells us that there was something else in the water that was causing the decrease in heart rate. Um, from the results of our data, we concluded that while there is some correlation between mortality and salinity, there is also a great deal of other factors in the water that could lead to the death of Daphnia. Um, while uh, many high salinities and very high concentrations above or at the LD50 um, had pretty much 100% mortality rates over the time, there was a great deal of lower salinities that also had high mortality rates. Additionally, um, one of the places we expected to have a high salinity, which was um, Lawrence Lynch, the uh, salt supplier, uh, that pond had a salinity of 0 0.4 uh, grams per liter, which was one of the highest samples we took, but it was also surprisingly one of the lowest mortality rates. And um, while this kind of goes along with our hypothesis that a majority of the uh, puddles were more toxic than the ponds, um, it kind of shows still that a majority of the mortality is not necessarily due to uh, the level of salinity. Uh, some errors that we found is that um, we could have had more containers of water to count the deaths. Um, also, we had human errors, such as we could have counted live Daphnia as dead ones, or we could have uh, miscounted heartbeats, both of which are pretty difficult to do. Um, if we were to do this project again next year, we could improve it by uh, having more data points and uh, sampling at more even increments, um, so that we'd have more accurate and reliable data. Another thing that we could do if we were to do this again is to discover what other toxicants could be responsible for this mortality and the more surprising of the uh, high deaths. Um, and then we could uh, also, if we find those, we could see what effect they have on the heart rate.
So, interestingly enough, the same day we were collecting our data, uh, Chris Neal posted a uh, article about Cider's Pond and the Falmouth Enterprise that reflected exactly what we found, uh, and that Cider's Pond has a very brackish water, which we saw in our data. Hello, my name is Georgia Labry Van Paris, and my name is Chelsea Bouchard. In light of current events, we have decided to do an analysis of the demographic factors behind the COVID-19 virus pandemic on the Cape. As you may know, COVID-19 is caused by a novel coronavirus and has become a global pandemic. The COVID-19 virus is a new coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2 that causes the disease called COVID-19. There are at least six other human coronaviruses, which can all cause disease ranging from a common cold to a more severe acute respiratory syndrome. There have been cases of other coronaviruses found in other mammals. And in fact, it is thought that most human coronaviruses originated in bats or rodents. The first known case of COVID-19 was traced to a seafood and poultry market in Wuhan back in November 2019. Shortly after that, cases were seen outside of China in Thailand, Japan, and South Korea. This caused the first round of screening at international airports. Then, less than three months later, the first case had reached the U.S. So the reason that COVID-19 has emerged as such a big threat is because it is highly infectious and has a high mortality rate. And while mild symptoms can include coughing, headaches, and body aches, more severe symptoms consist of vomiting and trouble breathing, which are more common for individuals with underlying medical conditions or older adults. As we mentioned earlier, this virus is highly contagious, which is due to the fact that it spreads to about 2.2 other people on average, with an RO of around 2 to 2.5. In comparison, the flu has an RO of around 1.5. COVID-19 also has a much higher mortality rate of around 3 to 4 percent, whereas the flu is around 0.1 percent. There are a number of different factors impacting the spread of the virus, including demographic, medical, and behavioral factors. However, the reasons why it spread so quickly are not yet completely understood. What we do know is that COVID-19 transmits through contact and airborne droplets. And as it is a new virus, there is no immunity in our population to it yet, which thus increases both infection and mortality rates. Some factors that appear to affect both the infection rate and mortality rate of COVID-19 are age, gender, pre-existing medical conditions, poverty, and crowding. Super spreader events may occur under the right combination of these factors. What we thought was interesting while researching was that the COVID infection rate on the Cape is below that seen nationally and statewide. We wanted to know what has created this 3% discrepancy. Our hypothesis is that unique demographic factors of the Cape contribute to this lower infection rate. And so we use public data to search for the factors that might have contributed to these differences in infection rate. What we noticed first was that Barstool County is older, relatively poorer, less populated, and less diverse than the Massachusetts average. Here are some specific statistics that we gathered. Our overall goal was to analyze whether differences in the demographics between communities in Barnesville County affected the infection rates of COVID-19. We first used the Cape Cod Healthcare website to gather infection data by zip code for all of Barnesville County, and then found additional websites on the demographic data for each community. This consisted of population, density, age, unemployment, income, etc. We calculated each infection rate for all zip codes in Barnesville County by dividing the total number of COVID-19 infections reported by January 28, 2021 by the population of each community. We then took the calculated infection rates and plotted them against the demographic factors that were mentioned earlier. Lastly, we performed a least squares regression, R squared, to see if there was a significant correlation between any single demographic factor and infection rate. As a whole, the CAPE ranges from an infection rate of less than 1% to over 5% and does not correlate at all with community size. 
You can see this represented in the graph below with a least squares regression of 0.02. There are also some clear outliers of Woods Hole, Hyannis, and East Falmouth. The strongest correlation with infection rate was seen with both population density and total community cases. This makes sense since being in close proximity, as well as having a higher count of cases nearby, are well known as being two of the leading factors in the spread of this virus. As seen below, the least squares regression is over 0.2 in both cases. We then looked at median age and gender ratio and found that increased age in a higher percent of males in a population shows at most a weak correlation with infection rate, which we found particularly surprising as this did not correspond with what we have seen on media outlets and COVID-19 guidelines. Commuter communities and higher unemployment may correlate with slightly lower infection rates. We are not positive as to why this is and would want to look more into this if we were to take this project further. So we attempted to look at how race had impacted this virus, but after collecting our data, it was clear that the lack of diversity on the Cape makes the impact of race hard, if not impossible, to determine. You can even see how taking out the outlier of Hyannis, which was the most diverse town in Barnesville County, affected the correlation. So we weren't able to derive any apparent results from this specific factor. There is no clear correlation between infection rate and school performance or income. So we believe that these are factors that do not impact the infection rate on Cape Cod. This experiment showed that the strongest drivers of infection on the Cape appear to be population density, and the number of cases in our community. In addition, the traditional commuter communities and those with higher unemployment may have been more protected, which we feel could be because they traveled less during the COVID-19 pandemic. The factors that have shown to impact COVID-19 on a larger scale in larger populations, such as age, gender, race, and income, did not show a strong correlation on the Cape. So in conclusion, we felt that it was truly the rural nature of the Cape that may have been the most important factor limiting COVID-19 infection rate here. As mentioned earlier, the outliers throughout this experiment were both Hyannis and Woods Hole. Hyannis has a high population density and high number of cases in the community, so it is expected that the infection rate would be rather high. As for Woods Hole, we expect that the virus must have been brought in from someplace else as there are no factors that would contribute to a high infection rate. Contact tracing and genetic analysis of the virus might provide additional insights into the dynamics of virus spread in these communities. It is important to remember that our analysis had limitations that may be addressed with additional data and multivariate statistical analysis. Compared to places elsewhere, the Cape has a relatively small and non-diverse population, which could hide other significant trends that affect COVID-19 spread generally. Using zip codes as a proxy for communities leaves room for error as important population dynamics and interactions could be missed. In addition, the public data that was available to us on the different factors may not be completely correct or up to date. And lastly, the behavior of this virus is complicated and likely influenced by many different factors all at once, which would require multivariate statistical analysis in order to identify. Thank you so much for listening to our project. In our last two slides, we have our work cited. Feel free to pause the video if you want to see the specific data sites used. Thanks again. Hi, my name is Roman, and my science for project this year is do different video games improve reaction time by different amounts. My hypothesis is that games where you need to make more decisions faster will improve reaction time more than games that don't rely on as many decisions being made. Uh, essentially, the more decisions you need to make, the more focused you're going to be on the game, and thus the faster reaction time is going to be. So our materials. We're going to need a way to play a video game. I'm using a desktop computer, 
some of my participants used consoles like an Xbox or a PlayStation. Each is going to work just fine. Uh, we're also going to need a, a way to measure reaction time. We're going to use humanbenchmark.com. Um, this website, uh, basically what happens is the screen will change colors from red to green. You'll need to click on the screen as fast as you can. And it will do this five times, takes the average of all five times in milliseconds and reports it at the end. And that's your uh, average reaction time. We're also gonna need a selection of different video games. Uh, I'll go over these in a second. And fourth, we're gonna need people to play these games. Um, I just uh, asked most of my friends to uh, be test subjects for me. So our procedure. Uh, we're gonna need a group of video games. Um, each of these games will have a different speed of play and different amount of decisions being made. So our first game is gonna be Minecraft. Uh, if you don't know what Minecraft is, it's a open world sandbox game where you can build and create whatever you want. Um, a lot of creativity involved. You don't have to make too many decisions that fast. It's a slow paced game and there, it's not very uh, focus intensive. Um, so it is the least of all, uh, the least fastest speed of play we have on the list. The next game is Brawlhalla. Brawlhalla is a 2D platformer, uh, similar to Mortal Kombat, if you've heard of that. Basically, each player chooses a character to fight with, and your character has a unique moveset. And you need to use these moves to outsmart your opponent and take away their three lives before they take away your three lives. It requires you to pay attention to where your opponent is and what moves they're using, and pay attention to where you are and when you should use your moves. Our next game is Rocket League. This game is basically soccer, but with cars. Uh, the only difference is that your cars can boost uh, and they can fly around instead of just staying on the ground. And this game, you're gonna be playing a three versus three game of soccer, uh, where you try and score on the uh, other team's net, same as real soccer. And you need to keep track of where your teammates are, where the opponents are, where the ball is, uh, and how much boost you have. There's a very fast speed of play, a lot of decisions being made very fast. You need to communicate with your teammates uh, in order to win. And our fourth and most focus intensive and uh, decisions being made game is Dead Cells. Dead Cells is a roguelike platformer, uh, very similar to Mario in many aspects. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, the only difference is that Dead Cells has a lot more decisions being made. A lot of the enemies do unique things. There's different, a lot of different types of enemies. Um, you have two different weapons and up to two gadgets and a bunch of unique skills that you acquire along the way. You need to pay attention to your health, pay attention to the enemies, um, and one wrong move or two seconds not looking at the game, not paying attention, could uh, could be failure. So Dead Cells is our most uh, attention needed game, and you really gotta focus on what you're doing. So, back to our procedure. Uh, so each participant is going to be, they're gonna have previously played the game, so they have a moderate amount of experience and they know what they're doing. Um, the participant will take the reaction time test three times on humanbenchmark.com. We're gonna take the average of these three times and that's gonna be the participant's initial reaction time. Then they're gonna play a video game for about 30 minutes and right after they'll record, they'll do the same thing. They'll take the human benchmark test three more times and we're gonna take the average of those and that's gonna be the reaction time after playing a video game. Finally, we're gonna collect this data, put it in a graph and compare it to see any differences in reaction time across different games. And we're gonna analyze that and see what it might mean. Uh, some variables we have, uh, the age of the participants, everyone that uh, played a game is either 16 or 17. Um, so that's constant. Uh, also the randomness of the reaction time test, you can't cheat on it. Uh, every time the screen turns from Red to green, it's a random amount of time in between, so you can't uh, 
just know when to click to get a better reaction speed. And our dependent variable is going to be the change in reaction time. So uh, how your reaction time changes from before playing the game to after playing it. So here's our data. Um, we had over here people and their initial time and their time after playing the game is the red dot. So uh, as you can see, our games Minecraft and Brawlhalla had very low change in reaction times, even though they had the best reaction time. Um, these two participants barely changed the reaction time at all. Uh, changed by only a few milliseconds. Um, and the same with this one. This one changed by about 10 milliseconds, but that's not too big of a difference. Um, we move on to Rocket League over here. Uh, these participants improved the reaction time by uh, roughly 30 milliseconds, as you can see from these graphs and these numbers over here. Um, and then we go on to dead cells and we see that these participants improve the reaction time by uh, about the same. So from this, we conclude that uh, Rocket League and Dead Cells are games with more decisions being made, uh, improved reaction time more than Minecraft and Brawlhalla as they had less decisions being made. So... Um, we saw that people who played Rocket League and Dead Cells saw the greatest improvement in reaction time. Um, these games required a lot of thinking and a lot of paying attention to properly play the game and uh, win. And people who played Minecraft and Brawlhalla saw almost no improvement uh, in the reaction time. And this showed that the games didn't have them... Uh, react to many things and have them very being very active uh, minecraft especially people weren't uh, doing that much in the game even though they were doing a lot of things they weren't doing that very fast so it's more of a laid-back game and it requires very few inputs every second and sometimes you just need to be holding down one button um, so it's not very um, reaction time heavy. There's not a lot going on. So my conclusion, based on the small amount of data I collected, I believe that games that require more focus uh, overall improve your reaction time more. The participants who played Minecraft experienced less improvement in reaction time, whereas the participants who played Dead Cells showed a large improvement in the reaction time. Though this is a small data set, we can still attempt to draw conclusions from what we have. If I could do it again, I'd test more people. Um, I didn't have much time this time around. It was sort of a last minute project. Um, but yeah, if I could do it again, I'd just test more people to get a, a larger data set just to further prove my point, hopefully. Um, however, I'd still be interested to see the rest of the data. Maybe it would change. Maybe uh, we would see different uh, trends and different reaction speeds. Um, but thank you. Uh, and have a good day. Recording. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you wanna just go ahead? Yeah. So our project is called Shapes of the Mind and it is on cognitive thinking, processing, and the speed of determining shapes. And I am Madison Mahoney. I'm Alexis Rady. <laughs> All right, so our objective was to um, figure out uh, what grabbed our volunteers' attention first, the name of the shape or the shape of it itself. So um, some background, this project was essentially based off of the Stroop effect, um, which is the delay in reaction time due to congruent and incongru incongruent stimuli, which is automatic versus controlled processing. Um, in the 1930s, John Ridley Stroop designed an experiment in which he tested response time to naming colors. So there were three parts to his experiment, um, or two. 
Uh, the colored names were printed in black ink and participants had to read and name the color and then color names were printed in colored ink and the participants had to name the ink color. However, the colored ink did not correspond with the printed color names. So if we go to the next slide, you can see an example of what he did. And so our hypothesis for our experiment, which is based off of the Stroop effect, is that the participants volunteering will take longer to determine the name of it, the shape itself with the incongruent printed words due to the inference of conflicting stimuli. Uh, so for materials, we had um, three separate sheets of paper. Um, one with shapes with corresponding labels, one with shapes with um, labels that didn't correspond to the shape, and then one with the shapes itself and no labels. And then we had a timer and then a journal where we recorded the, uh, the time. All right, so our procedure was pretty simple. It was, uh, we printed out the three pages with each of the corresponding pages, as Maddie just said. And then we had our participants sit down with one page at a time and we timed them for how long it took for them to complete the, the set that was presented in front of them. And then we repeated that step of timing them with, with uh, page two and page three. And then we, would, we gathered and interpreted the data according to the speed differences between each participant. And we use that data to determine our uh, experiment's validity. This is just so an example. This is just, yeah, the example of the sheet that we use. We used three lines of each set. So with the first line, there were three of those different, um, just a variety of. Yeah, each uh, set had 30. Uh, shapes to them so it was yeah. larger than this but yeah Maddie has seemed to have frozen so I'm just gonna quickly these are just our results for each of the sheets uh, we have our shapes with the corresponding labels and it the Sorry, uh, that table or that sheet in itself did pretty well. Participants were quick in reading the 30 shapes and then the shapes with no labels, it's kind of the same result, took a little bit longer because it wasn't reading anymore, it was identifying the shapes. And then our results for the labels with in, uh, the incorrect labels, there's a definite difference in uh, how long it took our participants shown by our graph. It. So on the graph, as you can see, the blue line is sheet one, which uh, is consistently the lowest uh, amount of time. And then there's uh, sheet two, which was the sheet with no labels whatsoever. It's just the shapes. And that's like sort of in the middle in between. Um, and as you see, sheet three took the longest amount of time throughout each participant uh, because of the interference of the incongruent words to the shapes. All right, so according to our data, the participants took up the least amount of time to read the shapes with the correct labels, and on average took the longest to name the shapes with the incorrect labels, which was um, making our hypothesis true. And this is likely due to selective attention, the speed processing theory, automaticity and parallel distributing process theory, processing theory. So uh, selective attention is the focusing of conscious awareness on a particular stimulus. So in this case, the attention is either going to be on the shape or the label. Um, so this theory in terms of this experiment shows that recognizing shapes compared to reading words requires more attention, um, which you could see between clearly the first and the second sheet because the first sheet with the corresponding names took the least amount of time and determining the shapes without any words it, together took longer than that. Um, and then there's the speed processing theory. And this theory claims that the brain processes words faster than it processes shapes. And in Stroop's case, 
the brain processes words and it faster than it processes colors. Um, and in our experiment, you could see that the, especially between uh, the first sheet and the third sheet, the one with the corresponding labels uh, was the fastest because the brain was able to recognize the word and read that fastest. And then on the third sheet with the incongruent um, labels, or the incorrect labels, uh, the brain was trying to focus on the shapes, which takes longer to process in general than the words. All right, and automaticity is what our brain does uh, when it is trying to cognitively process information. There are two types, it's automatic and controlled. Automatic occurs unconsciously, and when we're doing common and high practice tasks like reading simple words off a page or reading, you know, shape labels. And um, controlled deliberacy is focusing on something with like conscious awareness. So uh, for our, that would be our third sheet where they had to determine that whatever the label was on the shape was incorrect and then following with uh, what was that shape altogether with the conflicting label. And then our parallel distributed processing is when our brain creates different pathways for different tasks and it uses the strength of one uh, neuron pathway and sorry <laughs> the strength of one neural pathway and it says that sometimes some of them are stronger than another so in our experiment it might have not mattered the speed in which the pro um speed in which our participants read the the shapes it was the um the strength of the of their neural pathways over another when it comes down to speed and that's where we're excited. That's it. Yep. Thanks <laughs> for watching. <laughs> Hi, so we're Bronwyn and Zach Morris, yep. and our project is called How to Not Get Away with Murder um, Blood Spatter Analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for our research, um, basically the type of blood stains we're interested in analyzing are impact stains stains, which are caused by blood projecting through the air and are commonly seen as spatters, but also include gushes, splashes, and aerial spurts. Um, spatters are characterized either as impact or aerial spatters, and the appearance of the spatters depend on the speed in which it leaves the body as well as the force behind it. All right, so our question in dealing with these spatters was, does the distance and height of the impact of the blood droplets or the blood spatter affect the blood spatter that then results? And our hypothesis is yes, with the distance and the height, the distance and the height affect the shape of the blood spatter as its result. The increase of the height of the impact causes the diameter of the blood spatter to increase, while a decrease in the angle, the impact angle, causes a large elongation of the blood spatters. All right, so for our materials, we used a mixture of corn syrup and water and red food dye. For the blood. Um, we kept it in a Tupperware container. We also used a turkey baster as our means of projecting said blood. Um, we had six 27 and 3 4 inch by 22 and 1 8 inch white poster boards, a one yard stick, and a sharpie. So for our procedure, like I said before, we mixed the corn syrup and water and the red food dye to create the fake blood. We filled the turkey baster with the fake blood after, before each trial. Um, we set up one poster board at a time on the ground, each label of the trial one through six. Um, one of us stood about 36 inches behind the poster board, changing how high we positioned the turkey baster each time. Uh, we then measured the height of the turkey baster and calculated its respective angle to the board. We then took pictures of the boards and later analyzed the spatters. We did this as there was unknown rain ruining the boards shortly after they were used. So we have a video right here of one of the trials we did. I believe this is trial one, and this is us with the turkey baster. All right. Okay. So then we have all the calculations below of our project. So sadly, we couldn't, our original plan was to measure each diameter of each 
blood spatter and to measure the elongation that occurred, but sadly it started raining right as we were finishing the project. So we only had pictures of the board, which yeah. creating calculations with pictures is not the best result. Mm -hmm. So we decided to make our analysis off of what the pictures look like instead of measuring each one. Mm -hmm. So with our calculations to find out the angle of impact, we took the height that I was away from the poster board, which wasn't always 36 inches, and we calculated it into yards. And then we also calculated the height that I, the turkey baster was in the air. And by using trig, in particular, the tangent of the distance between me and the board over the height of how, hard, how high the turkey baster was to get the impact angle. So this is trial one and trial two calculations, and then trial three and trial four, and trial five and trial six. And then here are the pictures of our first two trials. The first one, I accidentally made a spelling mistake. Um, and here is trial three and trial four. Trial four was accidentally a mess up trial because as we were trying to make the blood spatter, I it accidentally went gush straight out and just fell straight onto the poster, mm -hmm. which is not the result that we wanted. And then here's trial five and trial six. So then the results that we got was that most of the time, the smaller the impact angle was, the larger the elongation was for the blood spatter. But these comparisons between um, trial six, five, and two did not follow this exact pattern. Um, some of them, that we calculated to be longer elongations ended up being shorter. But this was just for these few trials being compared to each other, being compared instead of being compared to the other trials. Um, like we said, for example, the trial six angle is smaller than the trial five angle of impact, but the elongation of the blood spatter of trial five was way longer than trial six. And this can be said about the increase of height too. The increase of height mainly caused the diameter of the blood spatter to increase, except for between trials five and six, mm -hmm. where this did not occur. Yep. So then with our experiment, there were a few errors and factors that could have altered our testing. Um, it was drizzling outside, which caused most of the blood spatter to start running as we were taking pictures, which could have affected the results. And while we did have pictures of the boards, we did have to throw them away because um, red food dye was leaking everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and because it was wet, after we took them out of the trash bags, all the red dye was just gone. And it ended up being plain pink poster boards instead of showing the fake blood spatter. Um, and we also noticed that as we did each trial, the corn syrup was lightening up, creating a more pink color than a dark red as we originally had, which could have affected how the blood spatter came out since the increase or decrease of food dye could have affected the force applied to it, which then would affect it running or not running. And the force that was applied to the turkey baster by pushing on it wasn't always uniform. I didn't put the same force on every single one, which would also affect the results of our experiment. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, um, most of our trials did line up with our hypothesis. Um, the results resembled the basic pattern followed by the elongation and the diameter size of the blood spatter analysis that forensic scientists use in everyday situations. Um, yet there were a few exceptions to the rule. Um, so the pattern and concept cannot be used in every single situation that is analyzed, but for most, it, they do hold true. And I forgot to say this beforehand, but with the corn syrup, when we originally started with trial one and trial two, um, the corn syrup started getting stuck into the turkey baster. So we had to add more water to the corn syrup, which could have also affected the color, which could have affected the kind of consistency of the mixture, causing it to be more easily dropped, not being thicker and being lighter instead. And here's our work cited that we used for this experiment. So overall, um, the generic pattern that forensic scientists use is correct, but it cannot be, how would you say, it can't be 
fully apply yeah. to every single situation because mm -hmm. there are some discrepancies that can affect the results. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Yep. Hi, my name is Cora Zuwalek, um, and this is my presentation on sourdough starters. So sourdough is a very unique type of bread. It uses a starter to produce the dough. Um, this starter is made up out of any flour and water. So sourdough is, the what causes sourdough to rise is the wild yeast that can be found anywhere, but specifically this time it's found in the flour. Um, also in flour, there's a special type of bacteria, which when activated um, causes the bread to rise along with the yeast, causes the bread to rise and create that sourdough flavor. Um, and sourdough has dated back all the way to the Egyptian times, um, showing that it's been around for forever. This is how people used to make bread. Um, and there are many different types of wild yeast found around the world. Um, this experiment was inspired by a study trying to figure out um, where the different types of wild yeast were located. Um, and there were a couple experiments done on the Cape a few years ago with this study. Um, and there was one type of common yeast that was found in all of them. This type of yeast is believed to have originated from the skin of grapes and is the microorganism behind most fermentation. Um, and because it's not airborne, it requires another organism to move it from place to place. So the question for this experiment was, what is the best condition, meaning inside starters versus outside starters, and type of flour for growing sourdough bread? So I had six starters in total because we had three different types of flour. We had regular white flour, we had wheat flour, and we had almond flour. Um, and I had one of each, um, I had two of each, excuse me. Um, one would be inside and one would be outside. So my hypothesis was that the starters inside would grow better than the ones outside because inside my house, the conditions would be much more stable. Um, as for the type of flour, I thought that regular white baking flour would do the best. Um, I would have liked to have made one out of rye flour because that's the most common type of flour these starters are made out of. However, we did not have any rye flour. Um, the only ingredients and materials are flour and unchlorinated water. Um, you need pH paper to measure, thermometer, measuring supplies, a mason jar to store it in, some napkins, and some rubber bands. So to make the starter, you'd add two tablespoons of flour and two tablespoons of water into the mason jar or any other container. We just happened to choose mason jars. You'd cover it using a paper towel and a napkin to hold it in place. And this was so that um, the little microbacteria could slip through the paper towel, but it would stop anything else from getting in. Um, and you'd place it in a warm location out of direct sunlight. And then every day you'd have to feed the starter to help it grow. Um, and before you fed it, you'd have to remove one tablespoon of it so that it wouldn't grow too big and escape the container. And then when feeding it, you'd add four teaspoons of flour and one tablespoon of water. You'd mix it together and then you'd scrape down the sides and you'd feed it every 24 hours. So this was our data throughout the experiment. The average temperatures and the average pH. Um, there's also a little key at the top to help you read which type of starter it was. And at the bottom, there's an ideal starter. Um, so all of our starters were a little bit off the ideal range. Um, the closest one was the regular inside one. However, even still, it was not close to the ideal range. It was still a little too, a little too cold on the temperature and a little too high on the pH. Um, one thing that I could not add in the table was every single time we fed the starter, we would also smell it because that also tells you a good idea of um, what type of yeast is in it. Um, and at the beginning, they all just kind of smelled like flour or bread. However, they all started to develop their own kind of unique smell. So both the regular ones kind of smelled like vinegar throughout the whole experiment. The wheat ones smelled like bread the longest, and then they started to smell a little more sour, and then they went to vinegar as well. And the almond ones smelled absolutely disgusting. 
They were so gross that I couldn't think of a word to describe them most of the time. It was just kind of repulsive um, to the point where if my dad had been in the room when I was feeding them, he'd leave to another room so he wouldn't have to smell them. So I would not have wanted to make bread out of those ones. And these are some pictures. So there's some on the first day before mixing and the other ones are on the final day to show how much they had risen which as you can see, they did not rise very much, not nearly as much as they were supposed to. Um, here's the almond ones and the wheat ones. And on the bottom right corner, uh, I showed a picture of the wheat outside one because at one point an animal broke through the top. We don't know if it was trying to eat it, but it must have smelled good because it continuously broke through the paper towel every day after we'd replace it. And that arrow is pointing to a bug that was inside of it, so we would not have made bread out of that one either. So the results, none of my starters worked. The conditions were not quite ideal, so the bacteria didn't develop properly so that we couldn't bake them. Um, and we're not sure why this is, because we followed the instructions exactly as they said on the website, but they were consistently much drier than they were supposed to be because like, as you can see in the picture on this slide, they're supposed to be very liquidy and ours kind of looked like a ball of dough most of the time. Um, and we're not sure why this was. So my conclusion, um, the average pH for all of our starters was consistently much higher than the average pH, which leads me to believe that something was going wrong, that the bacteria wasn't mixing or Either way, I think that that's a, a big point as to why it failed. Um, another, another point was that it was a little too cold for ideal sourdough starters, which could have caused the bacteria in the flour to die off um, instead of grow, um, which might be why they didn't rise. It's also possible that they just didn't work because that happens sometimes. However, I don't think that this was the reason. I think that it was because the conditions weren't quite right. So then after many months, this first, the first experiment was around May. This is at the beginning of February. So many months later, I wanted to try and make some successful starters this time. Um, and this time we were doing a different website because the original one did not work. So this website called for a half cup flour and a third cup water with each feeding. Um, and it, I would also discard half of the starter instead of just a tablespoon. So we had no almond flour left. Um, so I only made a wheat starter and a regular starter. However, even if I did have almond flour, I probably wouldn't have made another one because they were so gross by the end of it that I never wanted to smell it again. Um, and both of my starters were kept inside because at this point it was too cold for the starters to grow properly outside. So this is the second attempts data. Um, they were significantly closer to the ideal starter. Um, the temperature, again, was a little too cold, but the pH was a lot closer than um, my first attempt. And as you can see from these pictures, they rose a lot more and looked a lot more like regular sourdough starters than our first ones did. And you can see all the little bubbles in the sourdough starters. That means it's working and that they're mixing, and that's a good sign. Um, so the second results and conclusion, these ones were a lot more successful. I think that it's because um, there was a larger quantity of flour and water being mixed in each time, which caused like, which allowed a higher chance for the bacteria and wild yeast to combine and rise. Um, and although I was um, getting rid of a lot more, um, it was still consistently getting even higher and higher. Um, and as you could see, again, there were a bunch of bubbles, meaning that it's working well, which we had almost no bubbles in our first ones. So next time, I would like to make a starter using rye flour because that's the most common type of flour used for making sourdough starters. I'd also like to try a few other recipes to see which ones would cause our starters to work the best. And anyways, here's my work cited. Thank you.